the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the U.S. was caught completely off guard, left reeling with the unprecedented nature of the attack and figuring out just how to deal with it. America, and the whole world really, changed that day, and life in America certainly has not been the same since. Fundamentally, there were two major questions to address. How do we respond to this immediate attack, and how do we protect ourselves from future attacks? We'll first take a brief look at some of the key aspects of the U.S.'s post-9-11 counterterrorism strategy, largely centered around military interventions overseas targeting areas thought to be harboring known terrorists. It became known as the War on Terror. The focus of this war was to stamp out terrorism around the world, specifically al-Qaeda and other Islamic jihadists sharing the same anti-U.S. ideology and goals. This ultimately led to military interventions in the Middle East, specifically the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, which became the longest wars in U.S. history, the latter of which is still very much ongoing to this day. Although plans were announced recently by the Biden administration to finally bring it to a close as we approach the 20-year anniversary of 9-11. This strategy of eradicating terrorism wherever it exists by identifying terrorist threats and taking preemptive action before they can strike has certainly been controversial and costly. In terms of death, estimated at over 800,000 people, tens of millions of people displaced, and a price tag by some estimates of over $6 trillion. While we won't go into depth on the military aspects of the war on terror or the efficacy or unintended consequences of these policies, it is still important to highlight this background context. The war on terror also expanded the scope of law enforcement authority to fight this new terrorism threat. The USA Patriot Act, passed in 2001, provided law enforcement with new tools to conduct surveillance, expanded prohibitions on providing support for terrorism, tighter prohibitions on money laundering, increased intelligence collecting and sharing capabilities, and enhanced efforts to promote cooperation between police agencies, all with the aim to better defend against and prevent terrorism. These expanded authorities have come with tremendous concerns, though, over civil liberties and individual rights, particularly the right to privacy and protection from unreasonable searches and seizures, along with concerns over an increased emphasis on providing military equipment and military-style training to law enforcement. We'll discuss the specific provisions of the Patriot Act and the controversies surrounding them in two weeks. Now we'll turn to Homeland Security Strategies. And let's start with an often overlooked question. What is Homeland Security? Is it a program, a strategy, a department, an activity? Well, it can mean any one or multiple of these at the same time. It means different things depending on who you ask. The concept is fairly new, broad, constantly evolving, and can be difficult to pin down. For our purposes, when using the term Homeland Security, I'm not just referring specifically to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, but as a broad term for the overall protection of the U.S. homeland. When most people think of Homeland Security, though, the first thing that probably comes to mind is the massive federal bureaucracy created after 9-11 and the fundamental transformation of the U.S. response to terrorism. So, the next question is, why was this considered an important change to make? Why was the DHS created in the first place? After 9-11, multiple investigations in both the legislative and executive branches of the U.S. government were conducted to figure out what happened, the most well-known being the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, more commonly known as the 9-11 Commission. Over the course of these investigations, several failures to prevent the hijackings were uncovered. Before 9-11, there were over 70 ongoing law enforcement investigations into those responsible for the 9-11 hijackings, and different components of the intelligence community were aware that Osama bin Laden was planning hijackings in America and was conducting surveillance on New York buildings less than a month before the attacks. This points to one of the key law enforcement issues leading up to the attacks, the lack of interagency coordination and intelligence sharing. More specifically, the intelligence community lacked workable sharing protocols, a true leader or coordinator, and the ability to cooperate. There was rampant competition amongst different agencies. We'll return to these intelligence failures and additional responses to them next week. The creation of the Department of Homeland Security was one of the main responses to these failures of interagency coordination and intelligence sharing. 
This idea for the DHS reorganization was not new at the time. It was first recommended by the 1998 Hart-Rudman Commission, or the U.S. Commission on National Security in the 21st century, established by the U.S. Department of Defense. They found inadequacies in counterterrorism capabilities and suggested agency reorganization with congressional oversight. They recommended major changes throughout the executive and legislative branches to meet evolving threats to homeland security. Subsequent congressional hearings were held, but attention to these issues soon waned until after 9-11. In the weeks following the attacks, the Office of Homeland Security was established through executive order to develop and coordinate the implementation of a comprehensive national strategy to secure the U.S. from terrorist threats and attacks. These responsibilities shifted upon passage of the Homeland Security Act of 2002, which created the Department of Homeland Security. The central mission areas of the DHS include preventing and responding to terrorism and other catastrophic threats, preparing for and managing emergencies, providing border and transportation security, protecting critical infrastructure and assets, and facilitating interagency intelligence sharing and collaboration. Upon officially beginning operations in 2003, 22 different federal agencies were reorganized under the new cabinet-level department, which now has nearly 230,000 employees, making it the third largest federal department after Defense and Veterans Affairs. We'll next look at a few key DHS agencies, their responsibilities, and some of the controversies that have surrounded them. First, Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, handles border security and crossings. Prior to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the focus of border security was primarily related to drug trafficking across the nation's southern border. Terrorism prevention, however, has become the top priority of border security efforts by the DHS. The CBP was formed by merging Immigration and Naturalization Services, Inspection Services, Border Patrol, and Customs Service, which handled tariffs. CBP now has more than 37,000 sworn law enforcement officers, making them the largest federal law enforcement agency. The nearly 2,000-mile U.S.-Mexico border receives by far the most attention, where CBP faces many challenges, including rough terrain for patrol and monitoring of illegal border crossings, providing facilities and care for everyone who crosses while being processed, and inconsistent policies and support. But today, illegal immigration and homeland security are more intrinsically linked than ever and well outside the context of terrorism. Highly contentious and politically charged debates have centered on the efficacy of building a border wall and the shift from catch and release to arrest and deport policies under the Trump administration, which resulted in the separation of many immigrant families at the border, including those seeking asylum. And recently, many unaccompanied children have been crossing the border alone seeking asylum as well, overwhelming CBP's capacity to provide them with adequate housing and care. Another issue is the extent of CBP's jurisdiction. The CBP by law can only operate within 100 miles of a U.S. border, but that area is much bigger than you might imagine. Because of where people are concentrated in many major U.S. cities near borders, some estimates are that two-thirds of the U.S. population is within this 100-mile zone. This becomes most controversial when immigration checks are conducted far away from the border. The other major immigration and customs agency that operates everywhere in the U.S. is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. They handle not only investigations of persons suspected of being in the U.S. illegally, but also immigration and customs-related crimes as well. Illicit goods trafficking, financial crimes, human trafficking, and human rights violations, among others. It was created by combining the law enforcement arm of the Naturalization Service, the Intelligence and Investigative Unit of the former Customs Service, and the U.S. Federal Protective Service. Homeland Security Investigations, HSI, is the largest investigative arm of DHS, and the Office of Detention and Removal is responsible for removing undocumented individuals from the U.S., for this reason, ICE is often at the center of controversy as well over how individuals are selected for deportation and how deportations are carried out. Next is the Transportation Security Agency, or TSA. Anyone who has traveled by air in the last two decades is familiar with the TSA. It was created as part of the Aviation and Transportation Security Act, signed in 2001, and eventually moved to DHS in 2003. TSA is not just concerned with aviation security, but the entire transportation system, including waterways, rail, highways, public transportation, and pipelines. 
Aviation security, though, is the biggest component, with approximately 450 airports and 50,000 screeners. Many of you probably don't remember a time before TSA, but traveling by plane was an entirely different experience. Prior to 9-11, while there certainly was airport security, it was provided by private security companies, not the government. There was no list of banned items. You could carry a box cutter or a baseball bat even. And you certainly never had to be concerned about how many ounces were in your shampoo bottle. There were no terrorism watch lists, and no one was concerned about watching other people for suspicious behavior or unaccompanied bags. So it was a very different time. Some of the major controversies surrounding the TSA center on the invasiveness of searches, accusations of profiling when selecting who is subjected to additional screening, the effectiveness of screening procedures at identifying and removing weapons and other contraband, and the potential effects of body scanning machines on frequent flyers. And then we'll briefly touch on three other DHS agencies. One is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, which handles response, recovery, and relief to disaster situations, including terrorist attacks and natural disasters. They administer the National Flood Insurance Program and provide funds for relocation and rebuilding. The Secret Service was moved to the DHS after 9-11 from its previous home in the Treasury Department. They protect crucial U.S. assets. Beginning when it was first created with investigating the counterfeiting of U.S. currency, and now their most well-known responsibility, providing security detail for key U.S. officials, including the President, Vice President, and their families, among others. They also protect the U.S. financial infrastructure by investigating financial and electronic crime. And then there is the U.S. Coast Guard, which operates under the DHS but can be transferred to the Navy upon an order from the President during an emergency or an attack. The Coast Guard is responsible for maritime safety at U.S. coasts, ports, and waterways, including navigation aid, search and rescue, marine resources, environmental protection, and ice patrol, mitigating the risk of iceberg collisions. So those are some of the key agencies and reorganization efforts under the banner of Homeland Security. Now, going back to where we began, one of the major questions after 9-11 is how we prepare for terrorist threats to Homeland Security. One notable effort was to create an early warning system to alert the public of the potential risk of terrorist attacks, which became known as the Homeland Security Advisory System. It was color-coded from green, low risk of terrorist attacks, to red, severe risk. While the idea made sense in concept, it ended up being impractical for providing the public with useful information. People had a difficult time understanding what it meant when the risk moved from one level to another, or what should be done differently at each level. Eventually, it became sort of a punchline that the threat level was always at either orange or yellow. It was only moved to red once for about three days in August 2006 due to a plot to blow up a plane in England that was ultimately foiled. It never went below yellow the entire time it was in use. This system was ultimately replaced in 2011 with the current National Terrorism Advisory System that provides specific information as to the nature of known potential threats, such as the recent alert of ongoing threats posed by far-right extremists in the aftermath of the January 2021 U.S. Capitol attack. To this point, there are other important questions to ask as well. Is the Department of Homeland Security and the Homeland Security apparatus that surrounds it, which was designed to protect U.S. Homeland Security, set up in a way that can deal with the current and future challenges we're facing? Is the U.S. prepared for another major catastrophic terrorist attack on the level of 9-11? And how would we in the U.S. react to it given the current social and political climate of extreme polarization, divergent information sources, proliferation of misinformation, and widespread distrust in government and one another? Despite the disproportionate homegrown domestic terrorist threats, it has received far less attention and resources than international terrorism. This speaks to the importance of accurately defining the nature of the threat. Failing to appropriately define the nature of the terrorist threat can result in those who don't pose a threat being unfairly targeted, while those who do pose a threat going undetected. This highlights ongoing concerns over civil liberties and the public's role in providing information that could be essential in mitigating a terrorist threat. 
In addition to terrorism, there's the full scope of transnational crimes or crimes crossing national borders, human trafficking, cyber crimes, wildlife and natural resources, counterfeit consumer products, weapons and drugs, the impacts of climate change on the frequency and severity of natural disasters, the ongoing threats of school shootings and mass shootings in general, the destabilizing effects of widespread social unrest, the preparedness of first responders to adequately respond to these challenges. And then there's the question of whether these new homeland security responsibilities are diverting too many resources away from traditional policing efforts, along with many other pressing priorities, which points to another challenge, the cost and effectiveness of U.S. homeland security. There has been massive growth in both the public and private homeland security apparatus in the U.S., so large, unwieldy, and secret that no one has a real complete picture of how much it costs and everything that it does. It is an open question as to whether the homeland security response has been worth all the money poured into it, or whether the costs have outweighed the benefits. And that's where we'll leave off for this week. Next week, we'll focus more extensively on intelligence, including intelligence failures, the process of gathering intelligence and using it to inform decision-making, and the intelligence and homeland security function of law enforcement. Have a good one.